Jerry Coyne, please welcome him. Thanks, Bill. And I'd like to thank Bill and Kathy. I don't know if they've received adequate appro uh, approbation for their setting up of this uh, conference, so I'd like to <laughs> thank both of them. Can you hear me okay? Okay, so for the next 45 minutes to an hour, you're going to look deep in my eyes and listen to me. Okay. Um, and what I'm going to do today is practice scientism, which is the hegemony of science over other areas. And I'll do that in one area. What I'm actually going to do is, is counteract the, the uh, talk that Henry gave yesterday, which claimed that science and poetry were alternate ways of knowing about the universe. What I'm trying to do today is to try to convince you that there's only one way of knowing about the universe, and that's science. That's why I call it science various versus everything else. Actually, I'm going to answer two questions. The first one is, is science the only way of knowing about the universe? And you might say, well, yeah, that's self-evident, but I've been in arguments with humanities scholars for decades about this, who claim that literature is another way of knowing about the universe, or art, or music. What about humanities, art, music, math, philosophy, literature, personal feelings, and of course religion, which is the ultimate other way of knowing about the universe. So I'm gonna talk a lot about religion. Second of all, and you've probably heard this before, are there really big questions about the world and the universe and the cosmos that religion can answer and science can't? And I'm gonna answer the first question, yes, Science is the only way of knowing about the universe. And I'll, give, I'll define my terms for those philosophically inclined. And second of all, are there big questions that science can't answer, but religion can? And the answer to that, I'll say, is no. Um, there aren't. Science and religion can pretend that they have answers, but they don't. Um, let me begin by reiterating um, what Julian said earlier today, which is that religion doesn't really make propositions about the way the world is. They make statements about the nature of the cosmos that are in principle scientifically testable. Here's two, oops, sorry. Um, can't see very well. um, here's two either science, groups of scientists or science-friendly philosophers that, that admit that. And an honest theologian will admit that, yes, they do make statements about the way the world is. Here's two of them. I'll just read the second one by Carl Guyberson and Francis Collins. Collins, by the way, is head of the National Institutes of Health. Religion often makes claims about the way things are. You can see that in the Bible itself, in Corinthians, if Christ be not risen, then are preaching vain, and your faith is also in vain. You can hardly call yourself a Christian unless you have the empirical belief that Christ was born as the Son of God, died was, uh, after crucifixion, and was resurrected. So at bottom, and this, and this Steve Gould was very wrong, religion does make claims about the nature of the universe, and many of these claims are in principle scientifically testable, as Jillian said earlier today about the soul. Here's a survey of what Americans really believe. Um, this is very disheartening, but it is true. Jillian gave the data on the soul. I don't have the soul here, but you can see that belief in things like whether there's a personal God there, sorry, um, whether Jesus was the son of God, whether there's miracles, whether there's hell or Satan, this is a random sample of all Americans waivers somewhere between 50 and 80%. And a lot of these claims, like the soul or the existence of an afterlife, or whether Jesus was born as of a virgin, are in principle scientifically testable and are certainly scientific questions. Now, I'm going to dwell largely on religion as a way of knowing, but not completely. So I just want to talk very briefly about what I see as the incompatibility about religion and science when you consider that both of them tr make statements about the nature of the cosmos. And the incompatibility is on three, three fronts. First of all, it's methodological, how they find out the truth about the universe. Second of all, it's in the outcomes. What does religion tell us about the universe versus science? Third of all, philosophical disparity. Um, which is philosophical naturalism, and I'm not gonna talk about that now, but we'll be glad to discuss it later. In terms of the difference between methodology and science and religion, this is my favorite mantra, um, which I like because it's mine. Um, in science, faith is a vice, and in religion, faith is a virtue. In science, we have well de demarcated ways to find out what's true. Doubt, looking at the universe, making testable hypotheses, testing them, rejecting the ones that don't the evidence, um, consensus, 
amongst people that independently look at things. So in science, we have ways to know we're wrong because our hypotheses are falsified. In religion, you don't have any way of knowing you're wrong. There just isn't any, except unless science tells you you're wrong. If you're a creationist, science will tell you you're full of shit, and then you have to buy that. It's asymmetrical because religion can't say anything to science about whether it's right or wrong. And religionists know this, and it really pisses them off. That's really, I think, the basis of the resentment against science, because we have, we can falsify what they say, but they can't do the same for us. Um, there's an incompatibility of outcomes. I mean, this, this list tells you what the Abrahamic religions, in particular Judaism and Christianity, has told us is true about the universe. If, at least if you read the scripture, the creation story, the great flood, the efficacy of prayer, young earth, et cetera, and every one of these is wrong, and it's been disproved by science. But for a long time, every one of these was um, adumbrated as the um, gospel truth, so to speak, okay? Now, another reason why religion um, has incompatibility of outcomes, it's not just incompatible with science, it's incompatible with other religions. And we all know that religions make competing and often contradictory claims. And that proves that they can't all be true, and at most one of them can be true, but that's unlikely too, because there's no evidence for a deity. Um, you can see this by looking at what I call the phylogeny of religion. And here it is over the last 20,000 years, the history of religion belief, starting with the proto-religion, say 20,000 years ago. It branches off and off and off. At the upper right, this red and yellow and orange stuff, that's Christianity, and actually, at least this is a truncated diagram, there's at least 41,000 branches of Christianity, according to a theological seminary, the Gordon Cornwall. And then the three um, green lines are Islam, Sunni, Sufi, and Shia, but of course there's a lot more sects than that. That lone yellow line in the middle of those are the Jews, poor Jews, but you know, there's Reformed, Conservative, and Orthodox. So this is, again, an underestimate. At the bottom, the Eastern religions. Now this is how religions have split over the last 20,000 years. What does it mean? Almost every one of these splits, we were in biology, it would represent a speciation event, represents an idea speciation event. That is, there, there's a contradiction between two religions which causes a faith to break up into two, like the Lutherans, which are divided up on the basis of religion. And so religions contradict each other on a number of fronts. How many gods are there? What are the nature of those gods? Is Jesus the prophet and the son of God, or is it Muhammad? Can women be priests? Is there an afterlife, a heaven, a hell? Is evolution true? Can, can you give blood? Um, all of these questions have split religions over and over again, and the result is that nobody can claim that religion in general gives us any truth about the universe, because they're all at odds with one another. Now contrast that with science. Here's the phylogeny of science. Um, it pretty much is a straight line. We have some deviations where people will disagree about things. For example, the last one might be string theory. The one before that might be whether the continents are static or not. But eventually these questions are resolved and we have progress towards understanding the universe. Okay, so on to the ways of knowing trope. Um, is science the only way of knowing about the universe? That's the question. And to answer that question, I'm gonna adopt what Sean Carroll called his three tenets of naturalism in his recent book, um, The Big Picture, which I think many of you have probably read. First of all, there's only one world, the natural world. Second of all, the world evolves to, according to unbroken patterns, the law of nature. And third, and the basis for what I'm gonna say in the next 20 minutes or so, the only reliable way of learning about the world is by observing it, which means science has the hegemony of um, finding out what's true about the universe. Those who limb the other ways of knowing claim always make the same statement. Here's a statement made by those who teach evolution at Arizona State University, and I have to point out that Dr. Lawrence Krauss, who's sitting in front of me, also works at Arizona State University. This is how they teach evolution. They have a module in there to show that evolution and religion are complementary ways of knowing. This is actually taught in a public university, and it's the same. Um, evolution, science is good at answering the, the um, how questions, but it's no good at answering the why questions, okay? And you hear this over and over again. There are just two different ways of knowing. Well, I'm gonna try to convince you that many of the so-called why questions really are how questions, and the why questions that aren't how questions are questions that make no sense whatsoever. Oh. 
Okay. So I have to define my terms at the beginning. First of all, what do I mean by science? When I say science can answer questions, because I have a broad definition of science. Second of all, what do I mean by truth? Sorry. Um, I'm not going to go into that in detail. I've taken all my definitions from the Oxford English Dictionary, so if you want to argue with them, argue with those people, not with me. Um, that's my default way of getting out of philosophical arguments. And finally, what is knowledge? And I'll try to convince you that science, as I define it, is the only way of getting knowledge about the universe. So what is science? Um, my definition of science, I call science broadly construed. Um, when you think of science, you usually think of what this woman is doing in the upper left, being in the laboratory with a white coat. A prof it's a profession, or it's a body of knowledge produced by this woman. But I don't think of that. I think of science as a toolkit, as the ways that people use and this woman uses to find out what she's, to answer the question she's asking. And that toolkit I've always already mentioned involves doubt, inquiring about the universe, observing it, as Sean Carroll said, pervasive doubt, questioning other people, consensus, making hypotheses, testing those hypotheses, and so on. Okay, but that, that toolkit is not limited to people that are called professional scientists. When your plumber works on your sink, trying to find out where a clog is, for example, he, he or she, mostly he, um, is obeying the laws of hydrodynamics. Where is the blockage? Is it up here, is it up there? Where is the leak? That's a scientific way of going about answering this problem. A plumber does not sit there and wait for a revelation about where the clot is in your drain. He goes about it scientifically. Likewise, with an auto mechanic trying to find out where you have an electrical short, they go about it in a scientific way, making hypotheses, testing them, refuting them, and eventually solving the problem. You don't solve the problem of a car electrical short by revelation dogma or authority. And of course, there are even harder sciences, the archaeology, for example, I think when it's practiced by people like this, you know, they're scrupulous about dating things and finding things is also um, scientific. So all these people I claim are using the methods of science, rationality, doubt, testing hypotheses, and so on. And this is what I call science broadly construed. That is the kind of science which I claim is the only way of knowing anything about the universe. What is truth? You know what truth is, um, but I'll take it from the Oxford English Dictionary. Conformity with fact, agreement with reality. It is what is out there, not what is just in here. What is out there? And what is fact? I'll use Steve Gould's definition of fact, which is the truth confirmed to such a degree that it would be perverse to withhold provisional assent. Okay, that's a good statement, even though I'm not a huge fan of Steve Gould. And notice that the assent is it's a consensus definition of truth, and it's also provisional. That is, when you hit upon a scientific truth, there's always things that could make you reject it in principle. Although some truths like evolution are so firmly supported that I would bet millions of dollars, if I had millions of dollars, that it is an absolute truth. Okay. And what is knowledge? Knowledge defined in the Oxford English Dictionary and paraphrased by Coyne is the public acceptance of facts. So when facts are found out by people and then the public generally assents to them, including the group of scientists, then that becomes knowledge. So my question of whether science is the only way to find out the truth about the universe boils down to this. Is there any way to grasp consensus truth, not personal truth, but consensus truth about the universe, because that's scientific truth, besides what I say is science broadly construed? Are there other methods of knowing what's true about the universe besides this science broadly construed, this toolkit that is used by plumbers and scientists and archeologists and other people? And my answer is no, okay? Now let's look at some of the people that I've argued with this, argued this question with over the years. These are other areas that are touted as being ways of knowing about the universe. And I've divided them up by color here, um, social, sorry, social science, history, anthropology, and archeology. span Those are sort of the social ways of finding truth about the universe. In green, philosophy and mathematics, the logical ways of finding out truth. Literature, art, and music, this is the hard problem because that's the argument I have most common with humanities scholars who tell me that Dostoevsky tells us truth about the universe, for example. Personal feelings, I feel something in my head, therefore it must be true. And finally, the big bugaboo, the elephant in the room, religion. Okay, so I'll take these one by one and try to be very brief about this. The social sciences are, or at least can be, when practiced using the methods of um, science broadly construed, as scientific. 
okay? Let's look at one of them, history, for example. I mean, historians are scientific when they use evidence to come to a conclusion. So for example, we can say that Julius Caesar really did exist at about this time because we have his writings, we have writings of other people about Julius Caesar, we have coins with his image stamped on them, we have busts of Julius Caesar. There's a lot of evidence that Julius Caesar existed. That is a scientific conclusion based on evidence. In fact, we have a ton more evidence that Julius Caesar existed than Jesus existed, for whom the only evidence is in scripture, okay, in a book of fiction. Okay? Um, the, the refutation of Holocaust denialism, which is still with us, and you can read about this in Michael Shermer's latest book, comes from science. The examination of cyanide scrapings on the walls of gas chambers, the remains of gas chambers, the documents, the ordering of Cyclone B by the Nazis, various things like that. I mean, that has all been dispelled by science, and science can indeed be, I mean, sorry, history can indeed be scientific. When it's not scientific is when it makes flat assertions like these are the causes of World War I without any kind of support, and indeed it would be hard to determine the answer to that question. Anthropology and archaeology are also scientific, or can be scientific, and they're usually scientific the way they're practiced, unless you're in cultural anthropology, in which case you're involved in ideology rather than science broadly construed. I mean, that's gonna rankle some people, but that's the way it is. Um, and economics can be scientific. It's called the dismal science, but it's, sometimes it's not so dismal. It can make statements that can be scientifically tested. For example, the declining demand curve with quantity. The more donuts I give you, the, the fewer donuts you want, okay? The more you have of something, the less you want it. Well, that's a statement about human nature that you can actually test in the laboratory. So even economics, which many people consider the, one of the softest of science, is science broadly construed. So I would maintain that these areas, which are often considered humanities of a sort, are things that tell us the way that the things about the universe, tells us how the cosmos is in a way that can be tested and either confirmed or rejected. What about philosophy and mathematics? These, I claim, are not ways of knowing about the universe, but they're tools that help us understand how the universe works. What these are are systems of self-contained logic constructed by the human brain. I don't believe that math is out there floating in the ether somewhere, mathematical objectivism. Um, I think it is a construct of the human mind, but it has certain rules of logic to practice it, as does philosophy. And therefore, um, we speak in philosophy and mathematics of proof. You can prove the Pythagorean theorem. You can prove Fermat's last theorem. We don't speak in science of proving evolution or proving Newtonian mechanics because the idea of a proof is a logical idea. It's not, a, it's not an idea that belongs in science broadly construed. Nevertheless, I will maintain that these areas are of great use, particularly mathematics to the scientist. They're not, I'm not dismissing them by any means. I'm just saying that by themselves, philosophy and mathematics cannot tell us anything that's true about the universe. One caveat, things like the ratio of a diameter of a circle to its circumference being pi, or the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared. Um, those are logical conclusions of a set of axioms that comprise mathematics. I think it would sort of be foolish to deny that that's some kind of knowledge, okay? It may not be knowledge about the universe, but it is knowledge about the consequences of a system that you have constructed in your head. But it's not something that you is true about the cosmos. Now here's the big bugaboo, literature and art and music. I've been in a huge email war with Adam Gopnik of The New Yorker for years about whether literature can tell us what's true about the world. Someday we're gonna write this down as an exchange, but let's just examine this proposition. Can the arts, literature, art, music, and so on, tell us anything that's true about the universe, independent of science broadly construed? Well, in some sense it can, but in a very funny kind of way. For example, here's two examples of how art has told us something about the universe. The left, um, Moby Dick by Herman Melville. If you read that book, you will learn something about how whaling was conducted in New England in the 19th century, okay? On the right, the painting of Philip IV of Spain, one of the Habsburgs, showing that he has this protruding lower lip, which is called the Habsburg lip. How many of you have heard of the Habsburg lip? Very famous thing. It's actually a genetic condition called mandibular prognathism. So here we have two sets of facts that we find out from art, how whaling is conducted and what Philip IV looked like. 
Okay, doesn't that show that art tells us something about the universe? And the answer is no, it doesn't. Because in order to show that Herman Melville wasn't making it all up, you have to check what he says about whaling up against what we know about whaling from other sources, other documents. Same thing about Philip IV. There are many, many paintings of people where you can read, this is probably not the person depicted for reasons X, Y, and Z. How do we know that Philip IV really looked like that? Because there are independent documentations from his contemporaries that Philip IV, yes, he looked like this and he had a lower lip that stuck out and so did his descendants. Okay. So for literature to tell us this kind of truth, to portray reality in a way that we understand, you have to have independent verification. Remember, this is Moby Dick is fiction, and this is a painting that you know uh, we didn't know much about. And that means science broadly construed. So the, any kind of truth in literature that's conveyed about reality, you have to confirm it using independent sources, and that means that you have to bring in science, either construed narrowly or broadly. Another thing that people have told me, and this is James Woods, another New Yorker guy that I've been in an argument with, um, he, I asked him to give me one example of a piece of literature that told us something true about the world that we didn't know from science. And this is what he said, The Death of Ivan Ilyich, which happens to be one of my favorite books. By the way, I'm, I love literature, art and music. I'm not trying to denigrate it. I'm just saying it doesn't tell us much about the real world. The death of Ivan Ilyich was used and is still occasionally used to teach people in medical schools what it feels like to die, okay? Because it is a very vivid depiction of a guy who falls off a ladder and something happens to him. It could have been, you know, um, rupturing something or more likely cancer the way it's described. Tell, it, it's a very vivid description of what it's like to die, okay? But how do we know that that's what it's like to die? You have to cross-check what's in the death of Ivan Ilyich with other people's experiences of what it's like to die. In other words, you have to do repeated observations of what people say, and even then you can't necessarily believe them. <laughs> okay, um, here's another thing which is presented to me as a way of knowing. This is one of my favorite movies, Ikiru, one of Kurosawa's early films in the 50s. It's about a Japanese bureaucrat named uh, Kanji Watanabe, who after a meaningless life of shuffling papers, real, gets a diagnosis of stomach cancer, and he knows he's gonna die. What happens? He redeems his life by building a playground for children. And last scene, I won't tell you the last scene, you need to see this movie, it's really, really good. And if you don't weep at this last scene, you're made of stone. And anyway, here's two things about death. What does it teach you? Well, would your life have been redeemed by building a playground? I mean, this is not any kind of truth about nature. This is a truth, if you can conceive of it, it's what, a sort of literary truth. It's putting yourself in the shoes of somebody and trying to understand how they might feel in both of these cases, okay? So what I would claim is, that, well, I'll just say that, uh, um, there's diverging interpretations. For example, Ivan Elliott's when he's about to die, feels like he's being thrust into a sack. He's, he realizes that the mundane life is meaningless, and the only true life that you can live that has meaningful is a moral life. Okay, well, that's fine, but is that a truth about the universe? No, it's a truth about the way he and maybe Tolstoy felt. The same thing with Kanji Watanabe. He redeemed his life by building a playground. Do you, would you redeem your life that way? What does this say about the universe? Not much. It gives us fellow feeling with our fellow human beings but it does not tell us anything that we did not know before about the cosmos. Remember, this is fiction, okay? And there are diverging interpretations of how this fiction is to be taken. Same thing with religion. Here's um, uh, two of my favorite religious pieces. This is the um, Isenheim Altarpiece by Matthias Grunewald in the six, early 16th century. I, this is my favorite painting, even though it's about the crucifixion because it's just so amazing for the time. And it shows the glory of Christ's crucifixion, okay? That's the truth in that painting, or so I've been told. Here's another painting of Christ's crucifixion. This is called Piss Christ by Andre Serrano. It's a, it's a plastic crucifix immersed in a beaker of the artist's own urine, okay? Now, where is the truth here? Is it the glory and the majesty of Christ being crucified with Mary there, and um, I don't know who's pointing to him, there's a sheep, or is it mockery of religion as a needless superstition by putting a crucifix in a jar full of urine? It's a matter of interpretation. We don't, there is no truth here. 
Okay, what we have is a presentation of feelings. So I would say that, that art in general is not a way of knowing, it's a way of feeling. It's a way of putting yourself in somebody else's shoes and seeing what it might be like to be them. It's about sometimes fellow feelings, saying, hey, I felt the same way as that person does too. And that's some, perhaps some kind of knowledge, but it's not the kind of knowledge that is generally agreed upon because a lot of people don't feel that way. Okay? Other disparity, um, disparities, is war glorious like it is on the left with Napoleon, or is it a horrible thing that kills a lot of people? There's Guernica by Picasso, um, different interpretations. When this movie came out, Triumph of the Will by Lenny Riefenstahl, whose name unaccountably is misspelled on the poster, um, this was a glorification of the Nuremberg rallies of 1935, and its purpose was to show how wonderful Hitler and Nazism was. And that was the truth that was supposed to be embodied in this movie. Well, we don't feel that way now, okay? We don't see this as any truth. We see this as a horrible example of a despotic ideology that went wrong, okay? If there's, you know, if anybody, I don't know if we'll have time for questions, I doubt it, because this talk is kind of long, but if you want to present me with the truth that literature tells us, or the arts tell us, or music tells us that science doesn't, feel free to have at me, either in questions or in person. Personal feelings. Do we not, isn't there any truth in the way we feel about something? For example, if you say, I know my wife loves me, does that convey some real knowledge about the universe? Well, you know bloody well it doesn't, <laughs> because there's plenty of people that say this and whose wife is out there humping somebody else, someplace <laughs> else, right? I mean, what all you know can gather from this statement is that this person has this feeling about his wife. He may not even be telling the truth. He may not know that his wife loves him. You need independent verification of that, and you can see it all the time. One of the readers on my website pointed out to me, I just saw a group of teenage girls on a corner trying to figure out if a guy really liked one of those girls, and they were discussing the evidence. Did he call you back after the last date? Did he kiss you? Did he send you flowers? And of course, someday science will be able to go in and look at our hormone titers and our neurology and answer this question for good. But just saying that I know my wife's love me is not objective evidence about the amour between a guy and his wife. My stomach hurts. Okay, is that, tell us any truth about the universe. It's a personal feeling. Well, first of all, you have to determine whether the guy's telling you the truth. Maybe he's just trying to get out of school, okay? How do you determine that? You have to go to a doctor, right? You have to figure out, is there something that's making your stomach hurt? So all we have here is an expression of a subjective feeling that may not even be true, and even if it is true, it does not tell us anything about what's causing it at all. Religion is the ultimate expression of um, the other way of knowing, because, and it's based not on anything to do with science broadly construed, dogma, scripture, revelation, and authority. And this is instantiated in the statement, I just know there is a God. This is the basis of a whole school of philosophy. One of them, one of the big exponents is Alvin Plantinga, who, you know, very famous philosopher, religious philosopher, who says that, um, that, he, that if you know there is a God, it's a plain truth. You don't have to look for evidence because you have this feeling that there is God. I can't remember the name he gives this kind of feeling. But to, when somebody says, I just know there's a God, it does not have any truth content about the universe except that that person feels this way. It doesn't say anything about whether there is a God out there. And this is so much as obvious, but you have to remember that there's a whole bunch of people in this world that say that when you f know that there's a God, that that is indeed evidence for a God, that subjective feelings is a basis for knowing something about the universe. Does religion reveal truth? Religion has never told us anything about the universe, not one thing that science has not told us. Um, it could have said, and I think many people have said this, wash your hands after you defecate because there's little things in there that'll kill you unless you wash them out. But that wasn't known to the people who wrote the Bible, although it would have been known to God. So religion doesn't reveal the truth, of course not. Religion has never revealed anything ser serious, no single consensus truth about the universe, okay. There's a lot of things that's said about the universe that science has disproven, but nothing, you can find nothing in the Bible, although some people strain and strain to find quantum mechanics in the Bible and the Quran. There's nothing you can find in scripture that was new 
that really it was a scientific truth that preceded what scientists really told us later on. Okay, and this, that so ends the first part of the talk. I just wanted to summarize with this quote by Mike Gauss. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's one of the apostate preachers. He was a Lutheran minister, and for many years he was duped into saying that science and religion are different ways of knowing. They're not in conflict because science answers the how questions and religion answers the why questions. And for many years he preached this to his flock. And then, and this is a quote I really love, I was dead wrong. There are not different ways of knowing. There is knowing and there is not knowing. And those are the only two options in this world. I would claim that the knowing option comes only from science broadly construed. Oh, and one last question, am I, being, am I practicing scientism? Am I worshiping scientific reasoning? I'm not worshiping scientific reasoning. I don't set it up as a god to begin with. None of us do. We use it because it works, because it helps us understand something. I don't think you can a priori philosophically justify the scientific method as being the method that we need to use to find out truth. The scientific method is something that has evolved over the last five centuries as the time-tested way to find out what is in true in nature. So we don't worship it. We don't adhere to it like we would adhere to the Bible. We use it because it works. Okay, so much for that. On to the big questions trope. Science can't answer those big questions about life, but religion can. I know you've all heard this before. I hear it all the time until I weaned myself from reading theology, one of the best things I ever did. Um, here's an example. This is from a philosopher who actually my Polish friends knew. He was an atheist, but towards the end of his life, he became soft on religion, and he made statements that were pro-religion, the big question statements. And this is a good example of the big question statements. Who am I? Where did I come from? Where do I fit in? Why am I responsible? What does my life mean? How will I face death? And then he makes the the money statement, the more scientific discovery reveals, the more we realize it can't answer the great existential questions. Well, maybe it can't, but I would claim that religion can't either, and that the great existential questions are unanswerable by either science or religion. Some of them are, and I'll mention a few of those later. Um, this, try, this attempt to answer the big questions of meaning and existence is largely funded in the United States by the John Templeton Foundation. Um, John, Sir John had this idea that the more we studied science, the more we find evidence for God, and that therefore, you know, we needed to study things like altruism and compassion and gratitude because if we did the scientific study, we'd find evidence for God. This is the ultimate kind of natural theology, and to do that, Templeton dispenses millions of dollars every year to venal and impoverished scientists who can only get their money by kissing the ass of religion. Um, there's one of them making a bargain with the devil. Um, so what are these big questions that science can't answer but religion can? And I've taken as my authority here a very science-friendly liberal Catholic theologian whom I've debated, John Hott, and he's made a list of these existential questions, saying that it is the main business of religion to answer the big questions. Okay, what are the big questions? Here's a list of them. I don't know, can you read that? I hope so, okay. I'm not gonna go through this list. I mean, I'm gonna go through a few of these one by one. What's going on in the universe? Who am I? What does my life mean? Why be moral? Um, does God exist? Et cetera, et cetera. These are the big existential questions that the Polish philosopher claimed could not be answered by science, but implicitly claimed that they could be answered by religion. So let's examine that proposition. Can religion answer these questions? What does my life mean? Is there a God? What's the point of it all? Well, what does it mean to answer these big existential questions about life? Well, you can just give a response, because that's what religion does. You go to one religion, it'll tell you what life means. You go to another religion, it'll tell you life means something different, like worshiping Allah and you know, washing your feet before you pray, or not eating fish on Friday, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But what we want, because we're humanists and skeptics and scientists, is a correct response. We don't just want to know, you know somebody telling you, this is what your life means. We want to know what your life really means. Okay, because if an existential question has any meaning at all, then you want a response to that question that's true. 
So we're looking for true responses to this question. You're already starting to intimate, I think, that there aren't any. <laughs> Do all the big questions make sense? And no, they don't. So some of these questions are meaningless or ambiguous. It's useless to try to answer them. One of them is, is there a God? In a narrower sense, you can try to answer that, but first you have to define your term God. If you're a pantheist and you say, well, God is nature, God is love. Well, then the answer is yes, of course, you know. <laughs> it depends on what you mean by God. So the question prima facie needs to be narrowed down. And if you narrow it down to an omnipotent, omniscient, and omnibenevolent being, then the answer is probably not. And I'll talk to you about that in a minute. What is the point of it all? That question makes no sense to me at all. It only makes sense if you think that there is some divine being out there that created the world and you with a purpose, okay? And yet, if, to answer this question, you accept the fact that such a being exists. Do all the big questions have objective answers? And the answer is no. Some of the big existential questions don't have an answer that's testable or even makes sense. For example, how should we live? Or what can we hope for? I mean, if you'd asked what could we hope for before November 8th of last year, <laughs> you would have a very different answer than from what really happened. That's the only thing I'm gonna say about Trump in my talk. Um, how should we live? There's no objective answer to that question. I mean, it's just, it's a nonsensical question. It depends on what you want out of your life, okay? So, you know, that's the next step. But even then, religion can't answer that question. Do some big questions with objective answers have religious answers rather than scientific answers? This is the crux of the matter. Can religion answer some of these existential questions when science can't? Science, it must be impotent before them. And the answer is no, religion doesn't have any really objective answers. Where did the universe come from? And is there an afterlife? Let's look at the first one. Where did the universe come from? Um, the Big Bang is one answer. What was before that? I think probably Dr. Krauss would tell us that the concept of before the Big Bang doesn't make any sense because that's when time started. But I'll let the physicist handle that one. Is there an afterlife? Um, there, religion can say, yeah, there is. But I think as Julian told us, based on his lecture on the soul, there's no evidence for that. So there's no objective answer from religion, but science can address this question, and as Julian said, the evidence is against it. Maybe a 6.9 or a seven point scale. Remember that these religions have all tried to answer these big existential questions, and every single one of them has tried to answer them in a different way. There is no consensus truth to the big ex existential questions. Are all the big questions with objective answers if there are big existential questions that have objective answers, are these scientific questions with science broadly construed? And the answer is yes, they are. Where did I come from? Okay, there's a religious answer to that question, but there's also a mundane and rather salacious non-religious answer. And I'll get to this in a second when I give you the scientific versus the religious answers to these big questions. And why is there so much suffering? That's a question I think science really can answer and religion cannot answer. It's the question of theodicy versus evolution. And in that count, evolution wins. Now, let me say that science isn't perfect. I mean, it's the best tool we have, but there are some questions that science can't answer. Um, some data are nearly impossible to get because, we, well, we weren't there when it happened. Sometimes we, we don't have to be there when it happened. I think as Richard mentioned at the beginning of his talk. Um, but in some questions, when we weren't there when it happened, then when there's no way to get evidence for what happened. And one of those is how did the first self-replicating molecule, i.e. how did life begin? We might be able to replicate this in the laboratory or create life in the lab, but since we weren't there and since this was a soft-bodied small molecule, it's very unlikely that we'll ever have the answer to that question. And that's what I tell students when they ask me this question. That is, the answer is unfindable. There are also scientific questions where the answer has not been found yet but is findable in principle, okay? What is the neurological basis of consciousness? This is the hard question of consciousness. I have confidence that eventually we will find out how it works, because after all, it is a materialistic neurological phenomenon. But we don't know yet, and I don't have an answer to that. Is string theory an accurate account of particle physics? That's another question which 
um, we have, don't have an answer to, and it may indeed be unanswerable um, given the nature of, of string theory. Okay, so let's look at some of these big questions. Just a few of them, I wanna examine them briefly. Um, I've taken all of them and put asterisks next to the ones that are implicitly religious questions. That is, even to pose this question presumes that there's some deity that is involved in the answer. And that's almost all of them. So most of these big existential questions, by the way, not all of these are from John Hott. Some of them I've taken from other philosophers who have said, here's the big questions that science can address. The ones with asterisks presume that there is a deity to be able to give you an answer, okay? Now, since we don't have any evidence for a deity, that makes these questions suspect, at least on the religious answer basis from the get-go. However, a lot of these questions can be answered by science. Science can answer the big existential questions. You might not like the answers. You'll laugh at some of them, but you know they are answers and they're testable and they're objective. And those are the ones with the black asterisks. These are questions that science can really address. I'm not gonna go through all of them, just a very few. Why are we here? I'm gonna give you a religious answer and I'm gonna give you a scientific answer to each of these existential questions. Why are we here? Religious answer, God put us here. Now again, if you're a theologian, well then you go further and say, well why did God put us here? Why didn't he just skip the middle man and put us right in heaven or hell? That's a question that I've never seen a theologian answer um, adequately. But anyway, this is how religious people can answer that question. Science, we evolved from a primate ancestor and so on back and so on back, and you can read this in Richard's book, The Ancestor's Tale, um, back to the universal, least last universal common ancestor, which probably lived about four billion years ago on Earth. That is the correct answer of where we came from, okay? But this, the, the disparity between these two kinds of answers points out the ambiguity in saying that a question is a why question. Because there's two ways to construe a why question. Why are we here? That's a why question. But the answer I've given you scientifically is a how question, really. We're here through natural selection and genetic drift and genetic change over time. So a why question can be interpreted in two ways. What causes something, okay? And I've given you the causal answer for this question. The second way you can interpret it is, well, what intention was behind that phenomenon? And the very concept of intentionality presupposes a divine being, okay? Presupposes a God. So when you ask it, so not all why questions are unanswerable by science. I've just given you one that's answerable both by science, and I'll give you some more. So you cannot say, as those miscreants at Arizona State University have done, that science answers only the how questions and religion answers the why questions. By the way, Lawrence, you'd do me a great favor if you'd get these people to stop teaching this. Okay, good. <laughs> okay. Where did I come from? There's another great existential question. Religious answer, God made you. Scientific answer, your parents. <laughs> your parents, a little wine, a little Sinatra, that was in the days of my parents. And today it might be, uh, God, I don't even know what they're listening to, much less that that kind of music would ever inspire copulation. <laughs> the other scientific answer, of course, is evolution. Okay, that's where you came from. Okay. Why does anything exist at all? Where does the universe come from? This has been tried to be answered by both Sean Carroll and um, Lawrence Krauss. Um, the religious answer is God made it all. That's the answer. Um, the scientific answer is we don't know, which is a perfectly proper answer. If you don't know something, then say so. This is what religious people are unable to do, except on rare occasions when they say God's intentions are obscure to us, and we shouldn't expect to understand because he's such a complex being. So the answer to the, where the universe comes from, well, it came from the Big Bang, but where did the Big Bang come from? Well, maybe it came from, you know, virtual particles popping up that happens all the time. Is that nothing? Who knows? Dr. Krauss will answer that question as well. Um, but, there, you know, at least we're being honest as opposed to theologians when we say we don't know the answer to this question. And we may well know the answer, but we may well not. How should we live? Well, the religious people are always going to tell you the same answer. You want to live the way God tells you to live the way the Bible tells you to live. Of course, you're gonna ignore Deuteronomy and places like that, you're gonna ignore the invidious passages in the Quran. 
Notice, however, that the way God wants you to live differs drastically from religion to religion. So if you ask your imam how you should live or versus your priest or your rabbi, you're going to get different answers. Okay, there is no one answer. This, remember, we're in the big questions part, not the ways of knowing part. Scientific answer, there is no objective answer about how should we should live. But if you specify your goals, how you want to live, if you want, for example, prisoners to not, to not come back to jail again after they let out, then science can be employed in a broad sense to, to answer those questions. Why be moral? This is the worst answer of all, because God says so. If you answer God says so to the question of why be moral, then you are doomed in both Christianity and Islam to stoning women who commit adultery, to killing somebody who picks up sticks on the Sabbath, to committing mass genocide, killing everybody, their wives, kids, and animals, and so on and so on. So this kind of uh, morality that comes from the top down, um, the cosmic demand hypothesis is, is not good. Why be moral if you're a scientific answer? Well, you can demonstrate scientifically in principle that if you behave in a way that comports with what we call morality, that you will get certain goods, both personally and societally. You get along with your fellow humans, you protect yourself from opprobrium, you increase your reputation, and you increase the general well-being of other people in your species. That's a scientific answer that can be scientifically testable. You just set up different societies with different rules and see what the outcomes are. But that assumes you want these goods. If, you, if somebody says, well, you know, I prefer to kill people, I mean, because that gives me joy, how do you tell them that they're wrong? You can't. I'm not one of those people that believes that there's an objective morality like Sam Harris. I believe in a consequentialist morality. And what it means to be moral differs from person to person, from religion to religion. Here's the question I like because science can answer it and religion can't. Why is there so much suffering in the world? Who was it? Was it Seth that talked about this the other night? That 30,000 people died in tsunami and it's because God had to create the world with plate tectonics? Um, he missed out and they're saying, well, God didn't have to make the continent shift around, you know? <laughs> he could have made all the continents static and then we wouldn't have earthquakes and tsunamis. But God chose to do that and why he chose to do that is an unanswerable question. It's the question of theodicy and it is the Achilles heel of theology. God's ways are mysterious. Why God makes innocent people suffer? We don't know. I mean, you can have a theological answer to the question of why there is moral evil, why somebody's gonna stab somebody. You can say, well, they chose to do that because they're evil people. As Julian said, that's not an option if you're a determinist. You don't choose to do that. But there's also, there's also physical evil, like tsunamis, kids getting cancer, earthquakes, all these horrible things that happen with no explanation at all. And religious people just punt when they come to this. It is almost laughable, the answers that they give to questions of why there is physical evil in the world. Science has an answer. Okay, we do have plate tonics. The, the, the reason the continents move around is because they're resting on parts of the crustal plate that are floating on liquid underbellies, and when these parts collide, you get mountains, and sometimes they break apart and you get earthquakes. You know, th that's the only answer to it. Now, why do people suffer from this? It's because we have pain, both physical pain and emotional pain, and physical pain is an adaptation, almost certainly, that's been put into us by natural selection as a warning that something wrong is going on with our bodies. You could make a similar story for emotional pain. It is a way of dealing with and getting over with, getting over the rough parts of life. It's the thing, and I'm not sure that emotional pain is actually an evolved phenomenon, but you could at least claim it is. And at least I would say these answers are better answers than the ones that religion gives. Does God exist? Religious answer, of course he does. You're not gonna find, except maybe a Unitarian, that will answer this question in the negative or say that it's ambiguous. Um, the scientific answer is pretty much the same answer as Jillian gave for the soul. The evidence is against it. If we have a theistic God that wants us to know of his existence, why does he hide from us so much? And again, theologians haven't been able to answer that question. And Victor Stenger's big point was if there sh should be evidence for a God, and there should be, if there's a theistic God who loves us and wants us to worship him and is going to send us to hell if we don't, then by God, he should make his presence evident to us, right? Who is it, Bertrand Russell, that said, if you're called before God, um, 
and asked to account for yourself. He was an atheist, what would you say? And his answer was, not enough evidence. You know, If you're really a beneficent God, you'd say, you're right. Okay, there wasn't enough. <laughs> Um, so the scientific answer is there a God is, we don't know for sure, we don't know anything for sure, but probably not. Um, I like this quote from the Alabama philosopher Dallas McCown, the invisible and the non-existent look very much alike. Okay, what is the most parsimonious explanation? Why do we die? I'm almost done now. This is another question where we have a scientific answer to an existential question, not a religious answer because then we either reap reward or punishment from God based on how we live. That doesn't make sense to me. Again, why did God put us on earth as a way of testing us so we could decide whether to go to heaven or hell? He, knew, he knows what's gonna happen. Why, did he, why didn't he cut out the middle man? Well, there's a scientific answer why we die. It's complicated, it involves genetics, antagonistic pleiotropy genes that, that help you when you're young but make you degenerate when you get old. They're actually genes that are favored because you're gonna die from accidents anyway, so it's better to get your reproduction done young, even if the genes that do that make you hurt your finger and hurt your back and stuff when you, when you get old. Your, and your telomeres shrink, um, and the biological materials are impermanent, and so on, and so on, and so on. Now, you might not be satisfied with this answer, but it is a testable answer, and it is largely the correct answer. And finally, the last question, how do we find release from suffering or sadness? This is an implicitly religious question. The answer is, believe and worship God, and ye shall be healed. Those of us who do not accept that God have other ways of finding release <laughs> from suffering and sadness. These are material answers. I could, I could say something else, too. I mean, you know. But anyway, so the conclusion, as I finish, um, about the big questions. First of all, the, religions, the religious answers to the existential questions, most of them presuppose the existence of God and there is no evidence that's convincing to uh, somebody who's objective for a God. So those answers are out the window right out the bat. Unless you can prove that there is a God, you cannot give an, ex an answer to an existential question that depends on the existence of God. Religious answers diverge amongst the faiths. So therefore, they're not really answers. If an imam tells you one thing and a rabbi another, in what sense has that question been answered? <laughs> Religious answers often aren't testable, and so therefore they're not objective in any sense at all. Insofar as religious answers involve morality, I would claim that secular morality, and based on reason, evidence, and cogitation, is infinitely superior to morality derived from an ancient book. Every objective answers the existential questions involve empirical checking or testing, science broadly construed, and finally, we have to admit that some scientific questions aren't obtainable now or on principle. It's better, I believe, as Richard Feynman says, to not know something than to live with answers that are probably wrong. So to sum up, is science the only way of knowing anything about the universe? Yes, it is. If you have another way, I'll be glad to hear from you. I'll try to argue with you, but I might be wrong. This is a provisional talk. All these ideas are not firmly set in my mind. And finally, are there any big existential questions that science cannot answer but religion can? And the answer is no. Um, <laughs> and that's it. I don't know if there's time for questions or not. Okay, so I will hide myself off the podium. Yeah, sorry, we don't really have any time for Q and A. Um, we have to we have to get set up for the next speaker, and, and that's going to take a few minutes. So. Um,